webinars. These webinars consist in a series of lectures, dialogues, and roundtable. They aim at promoting a better understanding of the WTO accession process through the exchange of information and experiences. Our attendees are government officials, development partners, the private sector, academia, and all those who are interested in WTO issues. We started yesterday with uh, a session on the, uh, on the future value of the WTO membership. And the, in the afternoon, we had uh, an overview of accessions. Today, this third session, we will speak about bilateral market access, negotiations and goods. The objective of this session is to enhance participants' understanding of both the procedural and technical aspects of the negotiation process. We will uh, review five main items. These are the market access and goods. What do we mean by market access for goods? The technical aspects in consolidating bilaterals on goods again. Then uh, we will see how to get prepared for the negotiations. What are the evidence from past accessions? And uh, finally, how to successfully conduct the accession process. I will be co-presenting with Jorgen Wichtering. And uh, yeah, Jorgen, do you want to say a few words? Yes, hello, good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here on this panel together with Eric, with whom I worked for about 12 years in ex helping exceeding countries successfully conduct their negotiations. And um, so after I retired, I decided it would be nice to continue this work and uh, team up again with Eric in doing this webinar now. Thanks, Eric. Uh, thank you, Jorgen. Oh, by the way, I'm Eric Mingxing and I am uh, working in the Economic uh, Research and Statistics Division. And we have been providing support to the Accession Division for a number of years now. All right. So how we would do, we will have as I mentioned, five main issues we would like to talk about. I will talk uh, about the first two, then we can have some reply to some questions, if there are any, and then you're going to take the floor to deal with the other two issues. And then we will have uh, some questions as well. And uh, the fifth one, uh, after the fifth one, we will conclude. All right, so... All right, that's my presentation. And you may have seen there's a box for questions and uh, replies. So feel free to ask any question you may have. So we said we will have five issues. So market access on goods. What do we mean by market access? The general definition usually is the extent to which goods or services are accessible to foreign exporters and compete with locally made products. But in case of WTO, by market access, usually we mean, uh, this term stands for the totality of government imposed conditions, that is regulations and measures under which a product from one country may enter another country under non-discriminatory conditions. What is very important here is non-discriminatory. Those who are familiar with WTO, they know that this concept of non-discriminatory is really important for us. Within the WTO, you're not supposed to discriminate among members. For example, if an exceeding member negotiate a bilateral with, con with a specific country and uh, for a specific product, it would grant duty-free access to its market, then the acceding member should treat all WTO members alike and therefore need to expand this advantage or privilege to all WTO members. 
Market access in the WTO sense is regulated most of the time through border measures, which include inter alia tariffs, tariff rate quotas, quantitative restrictions, and other non tariff measures like SPS or import licensing, for instance. We mentioned non discriminatory. Article 1 of GAT, MFN treatment, most favored nation, you are not going to discriminate, says that any advantage, privilege, or immunity that is granted by a contracting party to any product originating in or this time for any other country shall be accorded immediately and unconditionally to the like product originating in or this time for the territories of all contracting parties. So here we have the most favored nation treatment in WTO jargon, MFN, and it is non-discriminatory. If you give an advantage to a, if an exceeding member gives an advantage to a specific, to a particular WTO member, it has to extend this advantage, privilege, immediately and unconditionally. This is therefore the principle we would use to consolidate the bilaterals. Whenever an exceeding member negotiates an advantage with a WTO member, this advantage has to be extended immediately to all the WTO members. So, in terms of goods for these advantage or privileges, where do we keep them? Where are they stored? They are stored in what we call the schedules of concessions. Article 2 of that, each contracting party shall accord to the commerce of the other contracting parties treatment no less favorable than that provided in the appropriate part of the appropriate schedule annexed to this agreement. So what it says is those advantages would be stored in what we call the schedules of concessions. And then each contracting party shall accord to the commerce of the other contracting parties treatment no less favorable. What do we mean by treatment no less favorable? No less means more fa favorable. If you give an advantage to a particular country, for instance, you would allow the import of apples in your country at 5%. This advantage is a commitment. And in WTO terms, we would say that you would have bound your duty at 5% for apples. Then you can give treatment that is no less favorable that is treatment that is more favorable. If your bound duty is 5%, you can have what we call an applied duty, and this applied duty shouldn't exceed 5%. It's bound at the, at the maximum of 5%. However, you can apply treatment that is no less favorable by, for instance, having a duty free on apples, or 1%, 2%, 3%. Or even 5%, but you shouldn't exceed 5%, which is your bound duty. So we would use those two articles to consolidate the um, bilaterals uh, on goods for acceding members. Market access refers to the totality of conditions and measures for entering specific goods and services. In, 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 into members' market. The negotiations are done a, on a tariff line basis and they are conducted bilaterally, acceding member with a specific WTO member. And those two parties would have to exchange what we call offers and requests. And we will see in the technical part what we mean by offers and requests. So results of these negotiations need to be consolidated and multilateralized. You remember, we talk about non-discriminatory. We talk about the most favored nation. 
the disadvantage that you have accorded to a specific WTO member need to be multilateralized to all WTO members. Obviously, bilateral negotiations are confidential and they take place between the acceding member and a specific WTO member without the presence of the secretariat. This is for bilaterals and goods, but we have some negotiations which is multilateral as well for an acceding member. All right. First two issues, non-discrimination and our schedules of concession. Let's see how the offers and requests may look like. Remember, we said Article 2, Schedules of Concession. This is an example of a schedule of concession. Each WTO member is identified by its own good schedule with a number. In this example, the schedule, for example, uh, consists of different parts and sections. And in this one, we are in Section 1A, which relates to tariff for agricultural products, and we are speaking about the most favored nation tariff. Earlier, I mentioned about this example of apples, no? So how do we describe the products? We have what we call, uh, we use what we call the harmonized commodity descriptions and coding system, the harmonized system in short. This is a nomenclature that is developed by the World Customs Organization. In this example, we have a heading 0101, which relates to live horses, live horses, asses, mules, and hemis. This heading is itself subdivided into three main categories. You can see that horses, you have one dash, Asus one dash and other it's one dash. What does other stand for? It's live horses, asses, mules, and hines. Other than horses, other than asses, and therefore we are left with mules and hines. So here, other relates to mules and hines. So the bound duty, the commitment of this country. For purebred horses, it would be read in tariff line 010121. Purebred breeding animals, and you can see it has two dashes, it's under horses. The commitment of the country is at the date of accession, it shouldn't exceed 5%. You can see here that the bound rate at date of accession is 5%. However, for mules and hines, which are under 010190, the country made a concession. Its commitment is at the date of accession, it wouldn't exceed 22%. However, it would lower this commitment to 20%, and it has to be implemented in, in that schedule, for example, it's 2018. When should it be implemented? 1st of January, 1st of July, 25th of December? Well, we have to be clear, so therefore here we have head notes in the beginning of the good schedules in each section. You, have a, you can have head notes. For example, in this one, it says that the final bound rate of duty, if differing from the bound rate at date of accession, will be implemented on the 1st of January of the year specified in the implementation column, which means um, date of accession bound rate is 22. You have to reduce it to 20. And, the, and it, would, it shouldn't exceed 20 on the 1st of January uh, 2018. Now, should this country wish to renegotiate its commitment, it has to invite a number of parties, among which here you would have, for example, 
the EU, which holds the initial negotiating rights. All right. So that was the good schedule, but that's the end. How do we start? We start with an initial offer, which may look like what you see on, the, on your screen. There is no rules, there is not any rules, but experience has shown that generally this is how acceding members would do. They would list all their products. They would use the apply tariff in, normally, the nomenclature of the apply tariff, and would list all their products with the product descriptions. Obviously, it's WTO, so the product descriptions could be in English, French, or Spanish. And they would put the offer in a specific column. Here it would be the bound duty. Very often, the acceding member, together with the offer, would present as well the current bound rate. Uh, sorry, the, the current applied rate. If they don't, we have seen that most of the time, W members would, would ask them to provide their applied rates. So in that simple example, you can see for the first product, 01012110, the offer, the applied rate is 10% and the acceding member offers to commit itself not to exceed 15% for the last product. The current applied rate is 20% and the offer is 25%. So that's what the acceding member put on the table. The WTO members have a look to this offer and come back with a request. Again, there is no rule, but this is how a request could look like. For example, for the first product, 01012110, the applied rate was 10%, and the acceding member proposed to bound its duty at 15%. Well, this WTO member has an interest in that product and, you know, your applied duty is already 10%. There's no reason why they should accept a commitment at 15% and therefore they request 10%. And they also have requested to be granted the initial negotiating rights in case this country has to renegotiate its commitment it is one of the parties that have to be invited. But this is just a request. It doesn't mean that the acceding member have to accept it. So there's a round, several rounds of negotiations. And finally, this, okay, this is how a, um, uh, a revised offer from the acceding country to a specific member may look like. The first product, which was of interest to a specific WTO member. Well, originally the commitment was 15%, but this country accept to lower its commitment to its applied duty and therefore propose a bound rate of an accession of 10%. However, for the loss, uh, for the second product, for instance, the applied rate was 20%. This country wants 20, uh, the request made was 15%, which is lower than the current applied rate. Well, for whatever reason, this acceding member has accepted that request, but needs more time to implement this 15%. Therefore, the revised offer is the following. The bound rate upon accession is 20%. It has to be reduced down to 15% within five years. And for that specific product, the acceded member has granted INR to the WTO member, but not for the first product, for example. Right, so we have a series of offers and requests, and finally, they uh, the W, the acceding member and the WTO members, they agree. Those bilaterals are signed and they are submitted to a market access division. 
we have we can have many 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 uh, bilaterals and we have to multilateralize all those bilaterals as we have said previously we would use uh, the most favored nation principle we would multilateralize um, the advantage privileges that a acceding member has accorded to a specific WTO member. In practice, how do we do? We put everything in the same nomenclature and then we look for the lowest uh, uh, duty, whether it is for the initial bound rate or the final bound rate. We look for the lowest duty we multilateralize this advantage to all WTO members. We spoke about initial bound rate and final bound rate. But if there is implementation period, how do we do? Do we take the minimum of the implementation period? Well, in fact, no, we don't. We take the period associated with the lowest final bound duty. And we will see in an, in an example what it means relating uh, as far as INRs are concerned, all the members who were granted INRs, we will just list them in the schedules of concession. Even though those INRs may not be associated with the lowest duty. Right, so this is an example here. In this example, we have three WTO members member A, member B, and member C. This acceding member has signed a, bilat a bilateral with three different WTO members. With member A, the initial bond rate is 25%. It has to be reduced to 10% within three years. And member A has requested to have the initial bond rate. And it has been granted the initial bond rate. Oh. Initial negotiating right, sorry. I'm making up new terms. For country B, the initial bond rate that was agreed upon and signed is 40%. It has to be reduced to 10% within two years. Whereas with country C, initial bond rate is 30%. It has to be reduced to 15% within one year. And this country has also requested to have the initial negotiating right. So we have to multilateralize those um, bilaterals, right? And for that, we use the MFM principle. Remember, we mentioned that for initial bond rate and final bond rate, we will take the minimum. What would be the minimum for the initial bond rate? What is this? Between 25, 40, and 30, minimum is 25. Final bond rate, 10, 10, 15, minimum is 10. Implementation period, three years, two years, and one year. Should we take the minimum? No, we would take the minimum of the period associated with the final bond rate. What is the minimum of the period associated uh, to the final bond rate? We have two bilaterals where the final bound rate coincides with the minimum. It's the bilateral with country A and country B, where the final bound rate is 10%. For country A, the implementation period is three years, and country B, the um, implementation period is two years, and therefore, for the implementation period, it has to be two years and not one year, which is associated with 15%. All right, so this might be the outcome of the consolidation. Initial bond rate, minimum 25%, final bond rate 10%, and within two years. Why didn't we take one year? Why don't we multilateralize this one year to all the members. Well, when you look at it, this acceding member commits itself to lower its duty to 15% to one within one year. It did not agree to lower its commitment to 10% within one year. It agreed 
to lower its commitment to 10% within two years. If we do what we call a staging matrix, you can see that for bilateral A, if we have linear implementation, that is equal annual reduction per year, then upon accession is 25%, you have to go down to 10%. So you have to reduce your initial bond rate by 15% within three years, meaning that every year you have to reduce it by 5%, 25, 20, 15, and 10. 10, 40 to 10 within two years, you have to reduce your commitment by 30% within two years, so 15% every year. 40 minus 15, 25 minus 15, 10. And within two years, you have reached your 10%. This is the commitment you signed with country B. And you can see within one year, it's 15%, it's here. So if you have a look to the staging matrix, and if you consolidate, you multilateralize the staging matrix, then you can see the staging is as follows, 25%, you would reach 10% within two years, 25, 15, and 10, all right? This is why we don't use one year, two years, because it, it is associated with the final bond rate. And here, from 25, it has to be reduced to 15, that is, you are reducing by 10%, uh, from 15 to 10, you are reducing by 5%. It's no more a linear implementation. First year, you have been reducing by 10%. Second year, you reduce by 5%. And it's non-linear because it is the outcome of the consolidation of linear bilaterals. All right, so that's the, um, that's the first two points. Uh, let me see whether we have any questions from the floor. Well, we have uh, two questions, one of which um, wonders whether we, they can have a video copy of this meeting. I guess uh, uh, that this should be, question should be dealt with by accession division, but I guess yes. Then the second question is if, for example, if country A has INO for country B, does it mean that country A has a first right to negotiate the tariff with country B before any other country? No, it doesn't mean that when a WTO member has to renegotiate, it has to invite a number of parties. Technically, we, these parties can be the principal suppliers, uh, the interested parties, and one of the parties is uh, the, um, the countries which hold the initial negotiating rights. Coming back to the video presentation, yes, Accession Division would uh, share the video and PowerPoint presentations to, uh, that are available to all um, to all the attendees. All right, so now I will give the floor to Jorgen uh, for the um, next issues. Thank you, Eric, for the uh, good start uh, and uh, explaining all the details. That is important to be able to master all these things. Um, now I um, broaden the scope a bit and um, to do that, maybe share this presentation. Okay. Um, <clears throat> when a country decides to join the WTO, um, the question is, you should ask yourself, I mean, why do I want to join? What do I gain from being a member of the WTO? 
And what are my objectives? What do you want to achieve for my, for my country? Because uh, joining the WTO is a long-term commitment and um, you need to be sure what you want to achieve and how to achieve it. And um, when you talk of WTO, you think always of market access, more market access. And actually, surprisingly, when you join the WTO, uh, normally your countries, your companies do not have better tariffs in WTO member countries after accession because the duties that are um, set already by WTO members will not change because you join the WTO. But what you will gain is you gain more security in the duties because once you are a member, the duties that WTO members um, uh, raise, the MFN duties, uh, cannot be changed uh, unilaterally vis-a-vis uh, -vis your country anymore because you're a member of the club. In addition, uh, in many cases already, members have existing free trade agreements uh, or preferential trade agreements that provide preferential access to many countries and possibly um, the countries that you are in as well. So th these things will not change. There's more security though in the MFN rates that uh, you will uh, enjoy as being part of the club. So what is the main objective? The main objective is to make the economic reform process that comes in with joining the WTO and there's a lot of legislative reforms that need to be undertaken, uh, more durable to lock it in and to make it a, a, an element that will can drive your economy and give your companies uh, and uh, economic actors uh, the environment in which they can thrive. You should not forget though that um, joining WTOs means often also, uh, most of the time, to open your economy, to be uh, to allow more competition, and uh, that means also that uh, some sectors that are maybe less prepared uh, to face the uh, global uh, economy may go through difficult times. So uh, you have to be aware of that. Uh, but at the same time, it is important that uh, this WTO uh, accession. Uh, and being member of the WTO will make your country also more attractive to foreign direct investment. Because, uh, you know, in the, today's environment with the global value chains, where products are produced in different countries, parts are here and there, and they're shipped across continents, it is very important for foreign direct investors to know that the duties that you raise on imports for example, that the foreign affiliate will uh, produce in your country, that these tariffs for the inputs will not change uh, drastically or without any reason, uh, and that they can rely on it by forging long-term supply chain relationships that could involve your country. The membership in WTO also uh, gives you a seat at the negotiating table. Uh, and uh, more important, uh, uh, you can use the dispute settlement mechanism of the WTO to um, settle disputes uh, with other members who you think treat your exports uh, unfairly. We know that currently we, this is not uh, uh, operational, we have some issues, but in the long term this will be uh, definitely uh, a major um, attraction to be part of the WTO, because if you're not a member of the WTO, uh, there is no reason why any WTO member cannot unilaterally uh, raise the duties against a non-WTO member. Therefore, once you have thought through all this, it is very important that there is a strong political will and at the highest level to move forward in the accession process. So how to manage goods negotiations? You have to understand, first of all, uh, in the negotiations, there is a lot of demands that come from current WTO members uh, to you to open up your economy, uh, to get market shares to, to in, uh, in your economy, to, in, to allow their companies 
to export more to your country. So you should first of all identify what are the member country's core interests. Um, you should um, discuss with um, the uh, government officials. You should have a lot of um, consultations also with businesses, uh, research institutions um, to understand these issues and to understand what uh, is at stake. Uh, it is useful also to um, undertake maybe uh, case studies in certain sectors to better understand these sectors. Because in particular, for example, agriculture, I mentioned rice here, uh, is often um, more vulnerable uh, than other sectors. And also um, the agricultural sector uh, has a lot of um, uh, importance um, emotionally uh, for, the, for the economy because uh, you, everyone says, yeah, we have to be able to feed our country, our people. Then um, also other sectors, one other sector which is sort of uh, critical is, for example, uh, uh, automobiles, because um, very likely um, there is, uh, you may not have uh, an old, your own automobile uh, car production. So there will be, um, car imports will be a big issue. And then you have to figure out what would be the right duties to set. You may, some countries sort of may think of uh, setting up factories to, to assemble cars from, uh, assemble cars from parts. So all these things need to be well uh, understood uh, so that when you go into actual negotiations, uh, you have the information you need in order to decide what level of duties you should set. Um, one other issue which is uh, important is uh, to have in mind what other external commitments uh, in terms of foreign trade you have already. Uh, does your country have already uh, existing free trade arrangements with other countries? If that is the case, uh, it is important to keep that in mind because uh, if you have a free trade area, um, often, uh, uh, or your customs union, you have a common external tariff. And uh, if you negotiate as a non-member to join the WTO, um, there is a risk that some WTO members may ask you to reduce your duties below the common external tariff of the free trade area. And this uh, can create a problem uh, because uh, if, that, if you were to accept this, uh, you would have to renegotiate uh, the free trade area agreement so that all the existing members would again have the same common external tariff. We've seen that in the case of uh, Kazakhstan, and it uh, led to a lengthy extension of the negotiations just in order to um, incorporate the um, commitments of a free trade area that Kazakhstan had into the negotiations. Uh, it is also good to be able to understand uh, common interests of members uh, so that you can deal with them uh, in the same way. If, uh, uh, some countries sort of uh, typically ask for um, access to dairy products uh, or meat. So you should have a strategy how to handle it um, in a similar consistent way with all the, um, these um, negotiating partners that have these same common interests. Uh, another thing um, to keep in mind is that uh, if um, tariffs alone uh, will not be enough to um, um, satisfy uh, the um, domestic economy, at least in the short term, you should um, think of other measures which are uh, perfectly uh, legal and uh, compatible with the WTO, like import licensing um, requirements, uh, uh, that would um, give you a better handle on how to um, control the flow of imports. 
So you keep in mind also that in principle, tariffs should be the only measure that you can use to protect your domestic industry uh, in the sense of, sort of uh, um, protecting it from too much external competition. That means you have to be able to set your tariffs at a way uh, that in the long term, you think your economy would manage and would thrive. So um, as for the sort of um, bilateral um, negotiations, um, you will be, um, uh, once the uh, accession process starts, there is a working party uh, that uh, has been set up. Um, and then there is a number of members can range from 10 to 20, 30, 50 for the bigger economies. Uh, you will have to start to negotiate with them. Uh, and it is sort of um, probably wise uh, not to start with the difficult ones because they are, are very experienced negotiators. You have to be very um, much aware and, uh, of how to deal with them in, in, a, in the right way. So it is always advisable to get some practice uh, and start with um, smaller um, uh, economies, maybe economies that so you have already political or, or other economic ties with that wouldn't want to sort of um, 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 really sort of um, um, push you too hard uh, just to get practice on the negotiations as such. And also it is a good practice to, to learn how to handle technically uh, the, the documentation and the negotiating process. For example, Eric told you about the initial offer and the bilateral negotiations. Keep in mind that these are big files. They are, um, the HS nomenclature uh, has uh, 5,000 and more products. And if you look at your national nomenclature, it may even be six to 8,000 or more. So you have to handle um, uh, your own um, uh, files and the bilateral negotiations in a very uh, systematic, consistent way that you don't lose track what you have committed already uh, so that uh, you know uh, where to give and where not to give in future bilateral negotiations. So once you, you feel more confident, um, try to, uh, you will start with the bigger partners, including even the, the, the big ones like US and the EU, uh, to improve your skills, not necessarily include yet with the biggest ones, but uh, start the negotiating process. Because the negotiations is not just one meeting, one exchange uh, of, of files, like uh, you make your offer, there's a request, and then you sign. Uh, very often there will be um, some uh, uh, issues where you do not want to um, accept uh, the uh, request from WTO members. And so uh, it will get, a uh, process will have many iterations. Um, and uh, therefore it is um, good probably already to, to know what the big players would want from you. But sort of maybe go slow before you sort of um, commit too early with the big ones. Now, once you, you gain confidence and when, I mean, there's always a time you can delay it for, for longer and longer. Uh, but I mean, at some point, there is a point in time when you say, no, we need to conclude soon. Uh, and then you need to sort of um, then finally um, do the last sort of um, uh, commitments. Uh, and this should be then with the, with the bigger and the more difficult partners. Keep that the conclusion at least uh, of these negotiations more towards to the end. Um, so members request. Uh, now what is our experience from what we witnessed from uh, uh, the negotiations in the past um, uh, and what we can learn from it and share with you? I think, uh, Eric, would you want to take over again? The first two slides. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. okay. 
All right. So, what would what are the common requests from members? One thing that uh, we have noticed is that WTO members tend to ask for comprehensive binding. That is, they would ask the acceding member to bind all their products. Since WTO, there have been 34 uh, acceded members and all of them have 100% bound duty except for three countries and the number of unbound uh, product is relatively small. It's a common request that you have. You will be asked to buy all your products. It doesn't mean that it will be bound at, bound at a low rate, but you have to make a commitment on all your products. And this will help in the in, for transparency and as well as for predictability. Remember, we mentioned that uh, treatment no less favorable. So you can have an applied duty that is lower than the bound duty. Binding your duty brings predictability and economic operators like that. They like economic stability, predictability. So if you bind your tariff, you will be asked to bind all your products. There's also a common request to use, uh, to limit the use of non ad valorem duties. The use of non ad valorem duties should be minimized as far as possible. What do we mean by non ad valorem? So for ordinary customs duties, we normally say, oh, the duty is 5%, 10%. But it's 5% of what? It's not 5% of the customs value. But in certain cases, countries use what we call a non ad valorem duty. They won't use the customs value as a unit. They would use a physical unit, for example, a physical unit like litre, number, head, pairs, meter square, meter cube. It could be two euro per meter or five dollars per kilo. That would be a non ad valorem duty. And mem acceding member would be asked to reduce the use or eliminate non ad valorem duties. And one of the reasons as well is for it's more transparent to have ad valorem duties. Other duties and charges should be bound at zero. Members seek commercially meaningful market access for their products. You remember that we spoke about the request or the offer, an initial offer. We have those columns with the edges codes, product description, the bound duty. And I mentioned most of the time, there's no rules, but the acceding member would be asked to provide uh, its applied duty. Why? Because WTO members want to see whether we, the new com with the commitment, whether they would have better market access. The members, WTO members, are really seeking meaningful, meaningful market access for their products. They tend to have special attention to tariff peaks. It could be that you have, for example, in your applied tariff, you have 7,000 tariff lines, 7,000 different products. Out of those 7,000, 6,800, the duty is between zero and five. But then for the few products, you can have very high duties, like 10% would be high with regards to 5%. It can be 20, 30, 50%. And we know of some countries, one country, where they have a bound commitment 
of 3,000 percent, for example. So members would have special attention to the tariff schemes. The applied tariff would be used to identify sensitivities of a seeding country. They would really analyze your applied tariff and to see whether there's a balance between the duty you're currently using and the offered commitment, commitment that you put, you're putting on the table. We understood that implementation period is granted only if bound duties are lower than applied duties. You would remember there was an example I showed earlier that the applied duty was at 20%, but this acceding member was asked to reduce its commitment to 15%. And this country asked for five years to implement this uh, change. So in general, you are accorded implementation period only if your final commitment is lower than the current applied duty. Members may need to take into account the demands of their politically active constituencies even in the market, in the absence of market opportunities. Well, this is very mysterious, no? Basically, what it means is sometimes WTO accession is used like a political instrument. Maybe in an acceding country, a WTO member has no economic interest at all. A WTO member is not exporting anything at all in that country, in the acceding member. This WTO member has no intention of exporting anything or importing anything from that country. But still, for different reasons, this WTO member may wish to um, prevent this acceding member from being part of the WTO. So there's a lot of different reasons. Then uh, we have noticed as well that a common request from WTO members related to sectoral participation. What do we mean by sectoral participation? W, uh, GATT 1947, 2020, today, WTO, there have been a number of negotiation rounds. And in those negotiations, members would push for the products where they have interest. Of course, if you push during those multilateral, uh, uh, multilateral negotiations for your products to be liberalized among WTO members, you would like the acceding member to do the same thing. So acceding members are kindly invited to participate in sectorals. A very common uh, sectoral that we have for many uh, Article 12 countries, that would be the Information Technology Agreement, ITA. ITA has been expanded uh, in the, during the ministerial in Nairobi in 2016, 2015. And um, we don't know yet, we haven't seen yet whether newly acceded members would be asked to participate in the expansion of ITA. The ITA as such, Sing Singapore ministerial, yes, uh, most of the time the acceding members are requested to accede to participate in that sectoral. It doesn't necessarily, if they can't participate in the ITA, very often you can see that for ITA products, even though the bound duty is not zero, it's relatively low. Another sectoral would be plurilateral in that case, would be the agreement in civil aircraft. And of course, we have pharma and chemical tariff harmonization. 
you have a number of other uh, sector, sector, roles, sector roles, like construction equipment, scientific and medical equipment, agricultural equipment. That was for uh, the non-agricultural sector, and for agriculture, it's often for oil seeds, distilled spirits, pork, and other meat. As an acceding member to the WTO, you would have so many requests. You would be asked to lower your duty on this, lower your duty on that, and when you lower, it might not be enough, and you would be asked to participate in a number of sectors. But as we have seen yesterday, someone mentioned that each, I think it was Demita, who mentioned that each accession is unique. There is no fixed rules. You are being asked to participate in a sector. It's just a request. You have to negotiate. You are, there's no reason why WTO members won't ask. They will ask you many things. And then the outcome of those requests would be uh, how you can negotiate with WTO members. Remember, there's no fixed rules. The level of concession is determined through negotiations. So now I think I'm going, uh, I'm uh, passing the floor back to Jorgen. I'm taking over again. Um, <clears throat> coming back to the uh, uh, point of um, uh, knowing your um, trading partners well, um, you remember uh, Eric talked about the um, INRs. INRs uh, are uh, the initial negotiating rights, which basically reflect the interest and the specific interest that nego negotiating partners, WTO members, have in the negotiations for products for which they want to reserve the right to be at the negotiating ta table uh, in case um, a WTO member would like to raise the duties above the uh, agreed bound rates. Now, um, Although uh, w, the members may negotiate about uh, many products, for some, which are sort of very important to them, they will also ask for an initial negotiating right. So what we did is we um, looked at the uh, uh, past accessions uh, and uh, found out uh, on how many products, and in this case, we define product as um, uh, a product group uh, described by a uh, harmonized system four digit product. There are about 1,200, 1,300 products groups um, uh, that exist. And uh, I selected just here sort of um, five countries which sort of are typically um, are active. Uh, uh, in the accession products uh, process, and uh, most likely uh, you will um, have to deal with uh, uh, each of them and uh, a few others probably, and um, looked at um, how many product groups in all the accessions they negotiated in did they ask for INRs. And uh, you will see uh, that, uh, for example, in the case of Australia, if I look of all the accession negotiations they participated in, they asked for INRs uh, consolidated in uh, 470 um, for um, product groups, which is about um, one third of the whole range of products uh, of HS four digit products. If you look at a bigger country like the EU or the US, you see that these countries basically uh, asked for concessions in all products. Hmm? The EU and the, the US uh, um, asked basically for uh, um, duties, reduced duties sort of uh, in all product categories. Japan is slightly less so. 
Uh, and um, Canada is about like the Australia and in the US, uh, Australia and um, so there, these countries, Australia and Canada, they typically ask for um, uh, better market access in uh, products uh, like agricultural products or mining products, because these two countries are uh, major exporters of um, mining and dairy products. Uh, so uh, this is the, the 470 uh, product categories you see here are um, most likely uh, in, in, in this uh, group of products. If I look at uh, Mexico, we have a more limited number because Mexico is not so uh, diversified as, as these other two countries. Now, if this is the uh, um, list of um, uh, uh, products that they ever asked for and asked. Now, if I want to see what really is their uh, core interest, I looked at uh, the products that uh, consistently they requested INRs in at least uh, 10 accession negotiations. And here you will see that the list comes down quite a bit. You will see Australia and Canada um, reduced to 76 and 110 products only, which is about uh, less than 10% of the whole list of four digit products. Now, surprisingly, for the EU, you also see a, a strong reduction uh, to just sort of 111 sort of core products that they systematically asked in more than 10 accessions. Now, this is very surprising, actually. And uh, I wonder if some of you have an idea of what it could be. Uh, but I give you some time before I come back to that. Similarly, Japan. Japan has uh, very few core interests, 67, actually less than Australia and Canada. So they're less persistent in sort of asking for a, a larger number of core products than these two countries. And here, uh, Mexico, even less, of course, there's a smaller country. But one thing that Mexico, if ever you've been to Mexico, you will see certainly tequila is on the list of core interests. And uh, you will have to um, probably grant them an INR or better market access condition, uh, better market access. Now, the US is, uh, has asked again, for nearly all products, but differently to the EU, the US has been very persistent in asking for many products and the same products uh, uh, in, in nearly every accession they're negotiating. And they're negotiating all the accessions, so you have to face them. So be aware that the US is a, is a negotiating partner that is a big country, that's tough, and they're going to push you on all your products, on nearly all your products. So be aware of this. Now coming back to the EU, I mean the EU is probably a more, bigger, more diversified exporter than the US, so why does the EU not push for so many products as the, as the, as the US? Now there's uh, uh, a good explanation for this because if you have already a preferential trade agreement with a country, you are actually not so much interested in um, pushing the MFN rate down, the rate that applies to all countries, because what it will do in effect, if the MFN rate is reduced uh, and the preferential rate is not changed, you use you, you lose actually uh, a preferential margin. That means the difference between the rates that you can get into uh, in this country and that everyone else can get is reduced. That means you lose your competitive margin. So therefore, the EU is probably not such a tough negotiator, especially in situations with countries where they have already uh, FTA or um, free trade area agreements or preferential trade area agreements. Uh, and therefore you see this result uh, for the EU. So this is, uh, and this would be interesting for you to know really, uh, to look at this because the core interests are really uh, reflected 
in, in sort of this number of INRs, which uh, um, WTO members consistently ask for um, um, for concessions in their uh, uh, accession negotiations. Now, going on to the uh, next slide, what is the outcome? The final outcome often is summarized by the symbol, by a single number that is sort of quoted in the press. The new average bound tariff of uh, member XYZ is going to be 8.3%. Okay. And so that is a key number. And of course, this hides a lot of details. But so just to show you, an, uh, give you an idea what we have seen in past accessions. I show you here initially the accessions of least developed countries over the last sort of 20 years. Uh, and these countries are of Nepal, Cambodia, Cap Verde, Vanuatu, Liberia, Afghanistan, Yemen, Laos, and Samoa. So the duty for these countries on average duty, it's an uh, average of um, um, ag agriculture and industrial products combined, uh, varies quite a bit. I mean, the, the range is usually between sort of, uh, uh, we have here, let's say 25 to just not even 30%, uh, 28%. Um, so, this is uh, what you sort of, it's good as it happens in mind as a benchmark. If you're an LDC, that is the result. Now you see two outliers, sort of Vanuatu uh, has a very high duty. I mean, there's an explanation for that because Vanuatu actually negotiated already uh, its accession, nearly concluded it very much earlier, I think in the 90s, late 90s. And then they stalled the process and um, for various reasons. And when they came back on the negotiating tables, they asked whether they could uh, use the negotiated outcome of uh, 10 years or earlier or 12 years earlier. And they were lucky that they, they got away with it. Therefore, you see this as a higher uh, rate than most of the others. Now, Afghanistan here is a bit lower than the average. And um, I, I think possibly part of the reason, and this is also something to keep in mind, is that Afghanistan sort of wanted to join sort of uh, fairly quickly. And therefore, if you want to join quickly, you have to cut more corners, you have to give in a bit more. Uh, and uh, therefore, sort of you see uh, that the uh, average duty for Afghanistan is um, quite a bit lower. Now let's go on. Uh, we have Eastern Europe uh, and uh, the CIS. Here you see, quite a lot of lower duties it's in the order of five to ten percent uh, a good reason for this is that many of these countries have already um free trade agreements uh, with major players like the eu or even with russia and therefore negotiating uh, parties and members would like to get into these big markets through the smaller partners of ftas and therefore uh, these smaller countries that are uh, have a good trading relationship, established trading relationship with bigger players, often face a harder time in, in defending higher duties. Uh, now, the middle range sort of is here of all other developing countries. And here we see duties uh, ranging quite a bit. You see that in the earlier period, the duties were much higher and then it came down. So sort of the latest here, Seychelles, uh, just below 10%. So this is uh, gives you an idea about the um, uh, uh, outcomes. What do you expect? Now, some sort of uh, more concluding um, slides is uh, uh, how to successfully conduct the negotiations. Um, um, starting with the negotiations as such, the, the process in, in WTO is very important and the uh, um, WTO chair plays a crucial role. It is important to be, uh, uh, to um, understand this and to um, uh, have a good relationship with the uh, WTO chair. Uh, one part one is very important in negotiations is to establish trust uh, with the negotiating partners. 
that the, when you say something, uh, they know that you don't change your mind the next day or uh, a few weeks later. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to um, uh, show all your cards. Uh, it uh, means uh, that uh, you uh, should be just transparent and consistent. Uh, you have to know where to give, in which sectors, uh, where you should sort of uh, be reserved and not give in yet, and also when to give in. Especially um, for critical products, don't give in too early and don't give in piecemeal. Uh, if you sign a deal, you have to sign it on the whole list and conclude with the country. Because uh, if you agree piecemeal, then there's often the tendency uh, to ask for more uh, because uh, I got this already. So I will push you now in the other area as well. Uh, you're most likely to have sensitive areas uh, where you need to sort of uh, keep duties fairly high. Uh, you need to be reasonable and be, have good arguments to justify this. Uh, members will understand that they don't want to ruin your economy if you open it to, to some sectors which are very vulnerable. So they want you to be a, a good partner of the club uh, to be thriving. So therefore, uh, don't hesitate to defend sensitive areas. Give good justifications. Uh, seek also external support. I think uh, I talked earlier about friendly countries with whom you have already trade and political relationships. Uh, seek their supports maybe to influence the more difficult members. You could even seek the support also of the WTO chair. Uh, use sort of um, big conferences possibly to um, uh, cut deals uh, when sort of the ministers or heads of states come to Beza, they can sometimes cut a deal with the um, um, lower level officials are not ready to cut. So these are all sort of um, avenues and uh, which you uh, need to look at in order to get your, um, your um, objectives through. Uh, there will be technical meetings, there will be informal and formal meetings in Geneva, ministerial conference. All these are contacts which you need to uh, make use of uh, to communicate your interests, your concerns, and uh, your expectations. Uh, sometimes it is good to invite a negotiating team to your home country, to your capital. Sometimes they are more compassionate to understand uh, what it means to, um, uh, to, uh, uh, to hear from your, your, your local people, what it means to, to, to give up uh, market, uh, to, to allow too much market access in certain areas. So, um, and it's good also to, to visit the capitals of the other, of, the, of your negotiating partners, uh, to hear from them. It is important, as I said, trust is important. It is good also to keep good relationships with persons handling the, the negotiations. Good personal relationships. It doesn't mean that you have to be uh, good to them, but the, you should distinguish between sort of being a tough negotiator and being a, a good pal. I mean, having a drink after a tough negotiating uh, session could be a good thing to loosen up because these persons that negotiate with you, they, they do it for, for their business. So they, they, they would like to negotiate hard, but at the same time, um, not to, to get angry or uh, to, to, f um, to have sort of personal ill feelings. So keep this in mind as well. Uh, there's a lot of, um, support that various donors can provide you. I mean, apart from the WTO through its seminars, WIPO uh, can advise you on intellectual property rights issues. The ITC also typically gives uh, a lot of uh, advice. And I think later on in the week, there'll be a person from the ITC talking about that. World Bank and UNCTAD usually also provide advisory services. There are NGOs like uh, the Advisory Center on WTO Law, and the idea center, you can look at the websites and see what possibly they could offer in your case. And sometimes members also provide bilateral support uh, uh, and there are other trust funds. Uh, so have a look 
uh, what and make best good use of all the all the advice you can get. But in the end, don't be a slave to the advisors. You have to make up your own mind. That means you have to judge whether the advice is reasonable, is supported by evidence, and is good for your country in the long term. Finally, negotiations in goods are less difficult than in other areas because it is basically you discuss about one list or long list of products. Uh, negotiations and services uh, deal with more with legislation, uh, which is sort of much more tricky uh, and um, they require a lot of expertise in these very different distinct respective areas. Uh, don't forget that uh, even in the goods areas, there is um, uh, legislative reforms uh, like the commercial law that needs to be adjusted to conform with WTO requirements that needs to go in parallel uh, and uh, needs to be accomplished before the accession can be concluded. Uh, you have to have a good plan when to give in and what areas, in particular sort of the sensitive goods uh, uh, hold back, uh, and in some cases, you may just say, sort of, no, I, I can't, I can't move an inch here, and and forget it, wait, and, and let let wait for them, hopefully, to move or get persuaded to change their mind. And uh, keep in mind that membership, becoming a member, is just the beginning. Then is when you have to sort of make use of it. It is just an opportunity. It's not that by becoming a WTO member suddenly your economy will thrive without sort of accompanying uh, measures by your institutions, without the efforts of your uh, entrepreneurs and the civil society. So keep that in mind. So as a summary, uh, the initial offer means just sort of you are in the game. And that is an important point to get this right also that uh, you don't sort of um, um, uh, set uh, the, the duties uh, in a way that sort of commits you in the longer term because you can't increase them later on. It's very difficult. So be, be careful to get that right. Then uh, getting serious, negotiating hard, and um, the last, anyway, this is a, uh, it is important, as I said in the beginning, to evaluate the entry ticket. What is the price you pay to join? What are your objectives? What do you expect to gain in the long term? Uh, then when you are serious about joining, you have to know what can I offer the countries? Maybe you have a big domestic market. Uh, so it's attractive for members to have you as a WTO member as well. Uh, at the same time, you need to uh, not give up uh, too much. Uh, also, uh, I would say sort of um, choose your battles wisely. Uh, is it worthwhile sort of to fight too long about a certain product that maybe is not so interesting, for, not so important for you in the long term? You may have to keep in mind that you may need to give up uh, the, uh, certain sectors that if you can't, please everyone at home. There will be, at least initially, some losers and there will be winners. It is important to turn the winners into big winners and the losers into sort of possibly not losing too much but getting com more competitive and also winning from the um, being WTO member. Uh, it is important, as I said already, to communicate your sensitivities. Members will understand uh, 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 if you justify it and uh, you do it effectively and uh, convincingly. Uh, what I said, it's a negotiation, it's a long negotiation, it will last sort of several years, five, ten years or so. Um, members can refuse to accept your proposals and so you can do so as well. You just have to define what is unreasonable. You have to find good justifications to refuse uh, unreasonable requests. 
and always keep in the loop your stakeholders. It is important that the private sector, uh, the civil society, media, parliament are in it. They need to be convinced that joining WTO is a good thing. If you have to face an uh, uphill battle at home at the same time as a battle with the negotiating partners, it's going to be uh, a difficult situations. So when you start off, get consensus or at least majority support for your plans uh, and that the private sector and the civil society is with you in your plans to join the WTO. And uh, this is where I stop now. Anyway, we are soon at the end of our time. And uh, I think there may be a few questions that need to be answered. So I just uh, get back to the, uh, how do I get back to the, Eric, you want to take over again? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Jorgen. So we have a number of questions here. The first one is, the average pound weight of Kazakhstan by the end of by the end of 2020 will be 6.3 percent. While the common external tariff or the common customs union is around 7.2 percent. In this case, what are the options to tackle the conflict? Um, with regards to WTO members, there is no conflict. The uh, bond comings might are lower, they are very happy. But they know, of course, when uh, Kazakhstan became a member, that because of the common external tariff, Kazakhstan would need to renegotiate. So, in the accessions uh, protocol, it's clearly mentioned that um, Kazakhstan will be able to renegotiate but it has to wait a number of years. And yesterday, uh, Kazakhstan's ambassador talked about that, and she also mentioned that there were thousands of lines where the WTO bound commitment was lower than the uh, customs uh, common external tariff. Oops, what have I uh, then? Um, okay, second question is, can we change tariff after accession, I guess after acceding to WTO, to WTO? Yes, you can change your tariff and you have to renegotiate with members. However, you have to keep in mind that when you renegotiate, you have to possibly compensate. And this is a price that you would need to pay. How will tariff affect negotiations? Um, I don't understand the question, sir. I'm not sure I understand uh, this question, but it's part of negotiations and uh, you have to agree with WTO members. You, we talk about binding all the products. How about binding coverage? For example, the binding coverage of Singapore is about 75%. Jorgen, would you like to... Uh, okay, sure. Um, well, I mean, if you look at the binding coverage of uh, uh, sort of, let's call them old WTO members, members that joined the WTO uh, before the Yoga round, you will find a number of countries that have um, binding coverage that is not 100%, because at that point, up to the end of the year around, um, members didn't expect necessarily to bind all products, but just sort of um, the key products. Here we'll see uh, 
even uh, uh, some developed countries sort of have a few lines sort of uh, that are not bound. And many developing countries uh, have a binding coverage that is less than 75%, sometimes as low as sort of 20 or 30%. Uh, it is only after the euro go around uh, when the members continued wanting to join, uh, the policy changed and from the new members it is expected that they bind basically all their tariff lines. Uh, but the old members sort of um, can still sort of um, um, keep the unbound tariff lines um, unless, I mean, in, for example, if there are new negotiations and like the door round which, uh, which, we, uh, which got started, one of the key objectives would have been in this round that all members bind all tariff lines. So uh, I hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you, Jorgen. And the last question is... Okay, we have no questions, doesn't matter. Um, can I, sorry, Eric, can I just continue with the last question? There was maybe sure. a follow-up. Sure. Uh, um, members, um, if once you're part of the WTO, this is, uh, um, you, you could ask other WTO members to increase the binding coverage, but there's no obligations whatsoever. And sort of very few countries um, increase their binding coverage after uh, having become members. I mean, there's a few examples, but very few. So there's no way in which sort of a country can uh, request uh, to, um, uh, from another member, uh, I mean, can exert any, in, any pressure on another member uh, to increase its binding coverage. All right, thank you, Jorgen. So the last question. It is interesting to hear that members may need to take into account the demands of their constituencies, even in the absence of market opportunities. Would you please give an example of that? A clear example that was widely shared in the press was during the Russian accession. Russia was acceding to the WTO and there was some incident with one of the WTO member, namely Georgia. And Georgia had to say something. Georgia had a position that it wanted to share internationally. And one of the fora that Georgia used was the accession of, w, of the Russian Federation to the WTO. But there are a number of cases like that. It's, uh, it's not only economic policy, but sometimes uh, there are more, uh, there are non-economic issues uh, that interfere in the accession of a uh, country to the WTO. All right, it's uh, 29 past 11. There's one more question. Uh, maybe I can take it. Yes. The question is about, um, is there any country that has more than zero ODCs? Um, uh, you will see that many of the um, older, sort of again, let me call them older WTO members, uh, have ODCs that are uh, higher than zero. Again, uh, after the yoga round, uh, members agreed that there should be no more ODCs uh, for new members. And basically all new members you will see if you look at their schedules have zero in the ODC column. There's very few exceptions and these are countries which um, are part of an FTA free trade area or some common external um, tariff where they pay um, a duty to, um, to some uh, community secretariat. But these are very minor, sort of says like a 1% or less than a percent. So basically unless there's a compelling reason, external constraints, uh, there uh, are, uh, you have to basically accept that you cannot have ODCs. There's only one duty, the MFN duty. Thank you, Jorgen. So I think we are closing this session now. 
thank a big thank you to all the attendees. Thank you for your interest. Thank uh, you to the uh, accession division who prepared the uh, technical parameters for us to be able to have this presentation. And thank you, Jorgen, for being for sharing your experience with us. It was a pleasure to be with you all today. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye.